a quote. It was just time. There was opportunity for me to take a stand and express the way I felt. I had not planned to get arrested. I had, not, I had plenty to do without having to end up in jail. I had plenty to do without having to end up in jail. But when I had to face the decision, I didn't hesitate to do so because I felt that we had endured long enough. On December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks refused to obey a bus driver named James F. Blakes, who ordered her to give up her seat in the colored section to a white passenger after the white section had been filled. Parks was not the first person to resist bus segregation. Others had taken similar steps 10 years before, including Baynard Rustin in 1942, Irene Morgan in 1946, Sarah Louise in 1952. Later, the United States recognized Rosa Parks as the first lady of the civil rights movement and the mother of the freedom movement. So a little bit of a history lesson is Rosa Parks is... is like we just read, is, is a lady that, she was a black lady that when people <clears throat> were racist and uh, discriminating against black people, she basically, she did such a small thing, but then was later recognized in such a great way. Uh, to me, it's phenomenal. I mean, when I think about the incident, when I think about the instance, um, if you were to think of just any bus in Chicago and then somebody, or even in Seattle, and how often do we hear about stories of people on buses in Seattle? Like who cares, right? It seemed, it seemed like such an insignificant act. It seemed like such a mild expression of of this greater thing. I mean, she wasn't Martin Luther King Jr. who was standing up there yelling from a pulpit, talking about let freedom ring and I want my children to be running around with other children. She was a lady that didn't want to give up her seat on a bus and she wasn't even the first one. Here's what she said. I had no idea history was being made. I was just tired of giving up. I had no idea history was being made. I was just tired of giving up. The difference with Rosa Parks and these other people was that they all went to jail. The only thing that Rosa Parks did different is that she pursued Basically, she went to court, and, and after it, she, she went back to court, and she kept fighting it all the way until it got up to the civil court. In other words, she took her stand, and then she continued to fight for what she believed in. And now she's recognized as, uh, let, let me read this, the first woman of the, uh, I forgot her title. Now she's recognized as the mother of the freedom, uh, freedom rights movement mother of the freedom rights movement. <sighs> to me, it's so significant because I know that in the church, in, in, in ministry, oftentimes it seems like the little things we do that we don't get recognized for, it seems as if they're insignificant. It could seem that cleaning up after the service so that it's good for tomorrow is insignificant. It could seem that telling somebody, some random person somewhere that you'll never get credit for is insignificant. Telling them about Jesus is insignificant, but it's so significant. And we don't know what the, the seed that we sow when it will grow or when it will sprout or if it's gonna take 10 years 
just like it did in this, in, in this bus rider incident, right? There was 10 years beforehand, uh, or in 1942, Rosa Parks refused to, to sit, um, refused to get up in 1955, but the first person that refused, the first black person that refused to get up for a white person was in 1942. And it wasn't because they were trying to be defiant. They were trying to stand up for something they believed in or sit down for something they believed in, right? And it took a solid 13 years before it bore fruit. But they're also recognized with Rosa Parks. You know, the other day or when we had conference here, <laughs> one of the people that a long time ago I preached to, this was, uh, this was three years ago. This is when Leanna and I were married. And I used to have a group of guys that came to my house. And the reason they were coming to my house is because I met them in a coffee shop and I told them about Jesus and I told them they need to repent. And then they all repented. Um, and when they all repented, I told them that I would walk with them and I would walk this journey with them. And we, we walked together for six months every single week. But one of the people that came was a young man who came for a few weeks or maybe for a couple months and then he dropped off and he, you know, he got back into smoking pot and, uh, and living this life of, you know, fast, fast cars, fast money, fast women. And, but at this conference, at this conference, he came and he sat in the back. But it was so interesting because he came to both nights. He came to the guys event and then he came to the conference the second day. And it was so interesting. He wrote me a message on Facebook. <clears throat> and he said, thank you so much for being consistent. It seems like something so, in, so insignificant. It seems like something that, to me, is, is not only, I don't call it a duty, but to me is like the bare essentials is to be consistent. Like in anything that you do, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right, right, to be consistent. But it's interesting to me that years down the road, he looked at that and he said, that's what I see as something that's going to lead me to Jesus Christ is that, that one man can stay consistent in the Lord. It can seem insignificant, but it's, but it's so key into the salvation of souls is the authenticity of our own faith is is the little things that we do along the way and that when we do them, we're wholeheartedly doing them with purpose. She said, I had no idea history was being made. I was just tired of giving up. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little sick. I remember another story. There was a guy in Australia a blind man who stood at the bus, and, and this isn't made up, this is a real story. I just, I forgot some of the names. I forgot all the names, but I remember the story. There, there was a blind man in Australia, and he would wait at the bus stop. He, he was blind, and, and the only way that he figured he could minister, or one of the ways he did, or the, the story doesn't say, but it just says that he did this every day. He would go to the bus stop, and for like four hours a day, he would just, everybody that came up, and he would hear him come up, and he would just say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. He did this for years. Years and years. And finally, at one point, he says that he got really discouraged because basically people just ignored him. Basically, people just ignored him. And then, but one of the people, I'm sure many of the people were touched, but one of the people that was, that was touched ended up giving his life to the Lord. And not only did he give his life to the Lord, he became a great preacher in Africa. And becoming a great preacher, I, th I think this was Reinhard Bunke's story. Is it? Yeah, I, I believe so. So you guys know who Rainbow, Reinhard Bunke is. So uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I, I believe this is his story, and so does Christina. So I think, I think we're on the right page. Um, becoming, and, and this is testimony, is that he eventually, he became, he went to Bible college and he became this preacher in Africa. And as you guys know, Reinhard Bonnke, he preaches to millions upon millions. And they say that a hundred million people have been saved through the ministry of Reinhard Bonnke. And at one of the crusades that he was preaching at, when he went back to his homeland or when he went back to Australia for whatever reason, he was preaching at this massive crusade. And he's preaching about his testimony about how he got saved. And the guy 
And the guy that told him about Jesus, that blind man was at that crusade. And afterwards he came up and, he, and, and this is the story that he told Reinhard Bonke. He says, I thought everything that I was doing was so insignificant. But these little things, these little seeds that we sow, they can, you don't know what the end result is going to be. We don't know what our impact is going to be. As we're talking about servanthood and we're talking about who, we're going to hit two aspects of it. And that who is, is you, right? The person that should be serving is you. It's every single person in the room. It's every single person that's a Christian ought to be serving in the capacity that you have, with the abilities that you have now. You can gain and you can learn more abilities, but it's with the abilities that you have now. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says it like this. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Notice he says living sacrifice. Um, this is not like other faiths where people are supposed to blow themselves up for their gods, right? God wants us to be a living sacrifice, to be sacrificial in the way we live wholeheartedly serving Jesus Christ, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. A lot of times uh, we have this phenomenal worship time here in church, and that's where we're honoring God and worshiping God. But Paul is also writing, as he's writing this book of Romans, he's saying that that the life that we live is our service. That is, it is our worship. That, that while we serve, we're worshiping Jesus Christ because it brings glory to God, right? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, which is selfish, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So now we need to know what the will of God is for our life, right? Verse three, it's so easy. I, I, yeah, I love reading the Bible. Any questions I got, it's like, boom, you want the answer? What is God's will for my life? Ah, and, then, and then it's just right here. Um, great. Uh, verse three, for by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with, to the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. For just as each of us, for, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We need one another. We have different gifts according to the same grace given to each one of us. And that grace is speaking of salvation. But we have different gifts, right? We have different abilities. We have come from different backgrounds. If your gift is to prophesy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. It's interesting, some of those, some of those in there, um, that's what they talk about the fivefold ministry is uh, having a lot of giftings. Um, but, you know, not everybody's merciful. Not everybody's giving. And, those are some weaknesses that we might have, but some people are giving and some people are genuinely merciful and they know how to show mercy to people. And if somebody's going through a hard time or if somebody has sinned, they don't come down on them. Instead, they help lift them up and they show the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And, they, and they'll find them the scriptures, not that say that you're condemned and going to hell for your sin, but they'll say, they'll say Jesus Christ forgives all sin. 
right? There's two ways of approaching people, and some people are merciful. If you are a merciful and kind person, we need you. If you're a sacrificial and giving person, which we should all be, we need you. Because without you, we're, we're imbalanced. It, it's talking about one body and many parts. And I think it's so crucial when we're talking about the who of servanthood is to understand that, that if I have one leg and I don't have two, it's, I can't get down the street just as fast as if I had two, right? Unless I'm in a wheelchair, I'm going to smoke everybody. But, um, right, I don't know, if you're going down a good hill and you know how to steer it, I don't know. I've never been in a wheelchair, by the glory of God. But um, if, if, you know, if you have one eye, I don't know if you guys ever tried walking around with one eye, uh, you can't see very well, and, and you actually, uh, everything is 2D. And you can't step well, you can't touch well. I'm serious, that's, that's how it works. So you need both eyes in order to see 3D. You didn't know that. Now you know, you did. You didn't know that. Whatever. You see flat. You can't, you can't see distance well. Um, so we need one another because can you imagine if, if a body is functioning fully well, how much better, how much further it can get, how much more it can do versus a body that is, that is missing elements like if I don't have my kidneys, then I got to be on dialysis three days a week. Like old Joel. Can we, can we close the doors, George? The point is that every single person is necessary. And it's not possible without you. We can, we can hobble along as a church. We can hobble along as a ministry. But we'll never be able to reach our full potential as if when everybody's involved. You're saying, well, I don't have, uh, you know what? Well, maybe I'm not a speaker or maybe I'm not a singer or maybe, you know, Rosa Parks, she was nothing. I mean, she didn't do anything. And, and what's incredible, I was reading a lot of history today, uh, but what's incredible about her story is that after the movement had started with Rosa Parks, um, she came to this big auditorium where they were, where they were giving a big speech. And... She, she was the main guest. And when it came time for her to speak, she said, what should I say? She asked, she asked them, what should I say? And instead they said, you've already said enough, right? All she said was no to the bus driver. And they say to Rosa Barks, oh, oh, what you've said is enough. In other words, your life is testimony enough. Every single person is significant, no matter how little the thing that you're doing you think is. The Bible says very specifically, do not despise small beginnings. I love the story of Jesus Christ serving the disciples and washing his feet. I I read an interesting quote today and it says that Jesus had no servants. In other words, he had no physical servants helping him or carrying his things or whatever but he was called master. He didn't have a degree, but he was called a teacher, right? Jesus Christ was the servant of all. He came, he, he left kingship in order to become a servant to you and to me. And, and while he's washing the disciples' feet, he tells them that the greatest of you will be the, service, the servant of all. When we understand that, when we can humble ourselves, when we can begin to serve Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, you'll see in your own life how God will lift you up. Living life with God as your provider is so different than living with you as your provider. My life verse and my favorite verse in the Bible, or I don't know if you're supposed to, whatever. But one of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you as well. The incredible thing is that when you live your life with Jesus Christ in the pursuit of Jesus Christ, number one, you have true happiness, you have true peace and you have true joy. Number two, God provides everything you need in life and so much more than you could ask or think. It's true. Look at my life. The Bible says to look at your leaders and and look at their lives as a testimony. Look at my life. Look at the life of our pastor, our senior pastor. Look at the life of our leaders in the church. People who have sold out to Jesus Christ 
who truly are in hot pursuit of Jesus Christ above all else, look at their lives. It's unbelievable. I was talking to my father-in-law about this, and he says, it's unbelievable the amount of favor we get. It's unreasonable because God opens up hearts. I was talking to somebody else about it too. They're also in sales. They say, I don't even know how it happens. It's just the favor of God. It's just the favor of God. It's interesting because the key here is that we're not in pursuit of the earthly things, is that we're in pursuit of Jesus Christ. I'm not in pursuit of being hooked up by God. I'm truly in pursuit of Jesus Christ. We should all be in pursuit of Jesus Christ. The who in ministry is you. Not for, not for my sake, but for my neighbor's sake, but for God's sake. You know that term, for God's sake. It comes from an actual, you know, it comes from a literal meaning like, for God's sake, I do things. For God's sake, I serve people. For God's sake, we feed the poor. For God's sake, we dress the, we dress the orphans and, 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 and we help the widows. And for God's sake, we serve one another. And for God's sake, we bear each other's burdens. I know I certainly cannot bear many people's burdens. I just can't. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a human. But imagine if, if we're all bearing each other's burdens. If we're all helping one another out. And not by saying things like, oh, well, he offended you or she offended you. Well, forget them, yo. But we usually don't say forget them. We start talking about screwdrivers. Some people got it. Kick them to the curb. No, we start telling one another to forgive. Look, don't let that person have residence in your mind. Don't hold a grudge against them because it's not them that's hurting, it's you. And they'll never even recognize that, they're, that you're being hurt. They don't even know that they offended you. I've offended some people. Trust me, I don't think I've offended anybody. I don't. I mean, sometimes I do, but I usually apologize when I offend somebody, if I know it. If I haven't, I'll just give you a blanket statement, I'm sorry. I don't even know. Maybe I did. Maybe I did offend your nephew. Heck no. Love my nephews. Serving one another, we're, we're helping each other out, we're, we're, we're givers, we're generous. In servanthood, the who is you. It might not be so big, it might not be so glamorous, it might not be so sexy, you might not be standing up on a big, big stage speaking to tens of thousands of people like Martin Luther King Jr., but she who simply refused to get up off the seat is recognized alongside of Martin Luther King Jr. It's the same way in the kingdom of God. It's the exact same way. The Bible says that God does not show favoritism. He doesn't look on one and says, well, they'll be great. And he doesn't look on another and say, well, they'll not be great. God looks upon everybody and says, you are great. Why? Because we serve a great and mighty and all-powerful God. And the Bible says that we are made in his image and likeness. And likeness. God's great, and we are called to be great. That's why we all have this internal and burning desire to do something great. Maybe it's in different fields. Maybe it's in different areas of life. Yeah. But we all have a desire to be great. Right? I don't know. I really, I truly don't know anybody that's like, I just want to be a loser in life. That's it. That's all I've ever wanted. Like, even if they play video games eight hours a day, it's because they want to be the best in their video game. Don't, don't make too many actions. I'm going to come talk to you after the service if you're still playing video games too much. 
That greatness is something that God instilled in you, but it's a greatness that's supposed to be given to one another. It's something that we're supposed to do for each other. I'm going to read you that scripture again because I already know you missed it. Some of you missed it. Some of you didn't, but some of you missed it. First Corinthians 12. Verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Read that again. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for what? For what? To each one, the manifestation is Spirit. Who's it talking about? It's talking to everybody that is saved. Now, if you're not saved, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the service for you to give your life to Jesus Christ. You can make that commitment to follow Jesus. He'll be your Lord and Savior. He'll lead you in life. If you stick with him, he'll always stick with you. But the Bible says that to each one, I'm going to put it in there, who say, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. And what that means is that you've been given a gifting. It's not to serve yourself. It's not for selfish ambition. It's for the common good. It's for you and everybody around you. My gifting is to serve you. Your gifting is to serve one another and me. We're all in the same boat. But we're all serving each other. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. So don't say, well, well, I don't have anything or I can't do anything. You can, and I know you can. I know you can. Every time I start getting into somebody's life, they're like incredibly gifted at something. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And you've just been sitting there? Come on. I just haven't gotten to everybody. But I, and I might not, but I'm going to send somebody after you. I, I will. We got leaders. Thank you, Jesus. We got some faithful leaders. Let me read you some more of the giftings. To one, uh, to one there is given the spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one as he determines. This is speaking of, excuse me, this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. This is speaking of God. Just as one body, though, has many parts, but all the parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit, so to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your standing is. We're all part of the body of Christ. No matter who you think you are, God says who you are. God says that you're great, you're wonderful, you're needed, you're holy, you're pure, renewed, refreshed. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now the foot shouldn't say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, it would not be for that reason to stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong in the body. It would not be for that reason to stop being part of the body. This is funny, he's, he's just basically repeating himself and the whole body, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? These are like very rhetorical and almost silly questions, and they're intended to be that way. Because this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and 
um, they had issues. It, the, the Corinthian church was a big church of about 100,000 to 120,000 people, and they had a lot of issues. And um, Paul's writing to them saying that don't all try to be speakers. Don't all try to be prophets. Don't all try to be the same thing. Do what you, do what you are. Do who you are. You, you don't have to try to be somebody else. You don't have to try to uh, uh, um, imitate somebody but be who you are and do it for Christ because if we're, if we're all doing our part, then, then we make one whole complete body. As, as it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. <laughs> On the contrary, those parts that, don't, that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The people that are behind the scenes are the ones that are the backbone. They're the ones that are the spine of the ministry. And without behind the scenes, there would be no stage and people on the stage. Right? When we talk about the who of ministry, we're talking about you. We are. We truly are. And at the end of the service, we're going to have an opportunity for you to sign up, be a part of something. There's different things out there. And I don't want to close because I want to close early, so I'm going to take the next four minutes and talk about who we are to serve. That's the second part of the who of ministry is, number one, it's, it, it's about you. You're the ones that should be serving, and the people that we should be serving are the following. Romans 15 says it like this. <clears throat> We're going to go to Romans 10 and verse 9. I just don't have enough time. Romans 10 and verse 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. In other words, God doesn't discriminate. They have the same Lord who gives them generously to, uh, who gives generously to all who call on Him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, here's here's the call to action. It says, "But how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless somebody tells them?" And how can anybody tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Can you come up so I can look at that? How can anybody hear if we don't tell them about Jesus? How can anybody receive the message of Jesus Christ if we're not all working together on mission to reach them? How can the gospel be preached from this pulpit if you, to, to a non-believer if you never invited them? How can we make this place welcoming if we don't have a committee of people that are willing to do coffee and tea and the things that seem so small but are so great? How can we have people feel welcome in this place if there aren't people who are creating us? How can this place be clean if there aren't those who are cleaning it? How can we make this place more comfortable so that we can lead more people to Jesus Christ? How can we disciple if we don't have impact leaders? How can we do it without you? The truth is, we can't. We can't. We cannot continue to reach people unless you get involved. We really can't. We're, we're the best at where we are right now, but if we begin to function more as a body, I truly believe that we can reach our city and this nation and our world for Jesus Christ. We have a vision. We have a mission. It's been set for us by Jesus Christ. You have a purpose and you have a calling. And it's not a joke. It's the reality. Don't push off the calling of Jesus Christ on your life. You're so needed. 
You're so needed. For a time and place as this. Come on, we're in messed up Seattle where everything's permissible. Did you know that they just opened up a clinic for people to shoot up heroin? We're living in a city that is so dark, but I can tell you what, each and every one of us walking in this place are a beacon of light. Don't hide the light. Don't hide your light. Make the most of every opportunity. Be a servant. Serve wholeheartedly. It's, it's your right. It's your birthright in Christ. And we're only here to help you. We will never hinder. We will only help you and raise you up. Myself, I promise that's my commitment. And, and our leaders have the same commitment that I have. And that is to make you great for the glory of God. Let's stand up together. As we pray, I want you to Consider your life and consider what is first and foremost in your life. If it is not Jesus Christ, I'd like to open up an opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ. Make him your first and foremost. If he used to be repent and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, pursue him wholeheartedly giving yourself fully to him. Let's serve Jesus.